Andy Armacost. I'm the president of the University of North Dakota, and we're delighted that you could join us this evening. I see that we have about 70 or so uh, folks who have joined us, and uh, we know that there are a lot of great questions. I'm thrilled to welcome uh, members of our team uh, on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you can see them or if you just see me, but um, they will pop up when, uh, when we call their number to answer questions. Um, but I just wanted to so first of all, say um, thanks to all of you, our students and our, our, our parents and family members uh, for all, all the effort and, uh, and focus that you've put into this fall semester. Uh, coming together uh, post-pandemic or as the pandemic is uh, continuing to evolve um, has required a great amount of patience and a, a great amount of support from across the campus and from family members as well. And uh, we're excited that the fall semester has uh, given us uh, many opportunities to come together as a campus, whether it's um, sporting events or musical events or anything happening on the campus. Uh, in fact, just last week on Friday, we hosted uh, the Feel of Korea, uh, which was a gathering to celebrate Korean culture. And so we welcomed the Consul General of, of uh, the Republic of Korea. He's out of Chicago. And it was a great way to celebrate uh, another culture and, uh, and uh, enjoy some food and some arts from uh, from Korea. And we also enjoyed our provost, Eric Link, who uh, joins us tonight uh, with um, an outstanding array of K-pop references, uh, rapid fire as part of his speech. And maybe he'll grace us with that opportunity again this evening. I'd also like to thank um, our uh, student body president, uh, Kaylin Reedy, who's here, as well as the vice president, Dawson Duchuk. Um, and their leadership has been uh, extraordinary this fall as they craft um, po new policies for the campus that support students, and uh, their participation in many of the conversations that we have about the direction of the university. So kudos to, to Kaylin and, and Dawson for their, their outstanding work. And uh, I'm trying to look at my, uh, my Hollywood squares to see who else is here. I, I see uh, Chief Rodney Clark who joins us. I think this is his first time with a town hall for students. Welcome Chief, good to see you. And I don't know if our um, Vice President for Student Affairs, our Interim Vice President who joins us uh, for this year on campus. Um, I, I don't know if she's on, but um, Dr. Beth Helwig, um, who was here earlier today. I, I think she'll probably show up here in a moment, but uh, we're delighted to have them as part of the team. I know there's many questions, and as I'm talking, feel free to start typing your question. Uh, we've gotten a number of questions from the folks um, uh, throughout uh, the, the week, and uh, I know that some have come in um, uh, blazing uh, today. So I know that there are some pretty hot uh, questions that have come to the group as well. We're eager to answer those. We're eager to also dispel some, some uh, myths uh, and some perhaps misunderstandings about what's happening with the federal vaccine mandate as well. And uh, I'll just say that the approach we're trying to take is one that keeps um, our students out of, out of the uh, vaccination limelight. And in fact, um, we're trying to understand federal guidance and take a very cautious approach so that we don't jump to any, um, any uh, um, I don't know, any events that might uh, put uh, students in a, in a tough position. Um, I would hate for a student to get vaccinated uh, potentially against their will, um, only to have the federal government um, come back and say, hey, I think the, the guidance has, has changed a little bit. We saw that last Monday when the federal uh, government uh, loosened some of the restrictions um, in terms of the timing of the vaccinations uh, from December 8th to January 4th. And what we're doing is uh, trying our best to tie um, vaccinations to employees who are involved or connected with federal contracts um, at the start of the period of performance of those contracts. Um, so uh, again, the, the approach we're taking is not, uh, is unlike many other college campuses at this point, um, uh, those campuses, uh, the general approach has been mandating uh, vaccinations widely across all employees, including student employees on the campus. And we're trying to take a, a more nuanced approach to, uh, through our read of the federal guidance. Um, we're gonna take it patiently. We'll keep you informed uh, about what to expect um, and we'll make sure that family members are also well, well versed and well informed about uh, the direction that we're heading. And with that, let me stop talking. I was, I was just talking to give you some time to type. I see three questions there. Let me introduce Dr. Cassie Gerhardt, our Associate uh, Vice President for Student Affairs. She does a remarkable job in these settings, uh, emceeing and, and, uh, and making sure that uh, the right people are called upon to answer the questions. Cassie, good evening. I hope you're well. Good evening, President Armacost. I am, thank you so much. Um, Good evening, students, parents, guests that are joining us. We are happy to have you here. I'll just share first and foremost, North Dakota weather update. Not sure where you're at. We are in the final days of fall here in Grand Forks. Those snowflake icons are starting to show up in our Apple weather apps. And so we could see the first um, flurries by the end of 
um, this week. So for those of you who aren't joining us in Grand Forks. So um, I am gonna get us started. Um, keep adding your questions to the Q&A. I do have some questions that I received directly throughout the day. So I'm going to start with some of those that are in my email inbox. I will ask my colleagues to um, please unmute themselves and introduce themselves as I um, call on them and we will get things started. President Armacost, I'm gonna pick up right where you kind of introduced it. Can you talk a little bit about the federal mandate and who right now we believe it applies to? I'm getting some emails from students and parents who believe that the mandate is um, far reaching and that this is a mandate for all students and all employees. Can you talk a little bit about where the university is at in terms of the federal mandate for vaccines right now? Right, and, and I think the key is right now, um, based on our reading and uh, the current um, uh, information that we've gotten from the federal government, our impression is this, that, um, and, and what we're enforcing is this, that uh, students in general um, will not require vaccination. If they're employees on a federal contract uh, and somehow connected with a federal contract, and they'll be notified if they are, um, that's where um, uh, vaccination would be required. Um, if, uh, if, if employees, uh, non-student employees, so faculty and staff members, if they're working on federal contracts, or if they're connected with the work, um, it could be HR or finance or some others who are uh, supporting a federal contract, um, those folks would have um, a, a required uh, vaccination. Um, this is, um, we're, the, the interesting part of this is we're waiting to see how um, the state legislature uh, moves forward as well as the federal government. And then in addition, there's a lawsuit uh, from uh, our attorney general against uh, the Biden administration uh, to put a halt uh, to the mandate. And we're watching it very carefully. What we don't want to do is, is get ahead of these things and start vaccinating uh, widely uh, when in fact um, the guidance could very well change. So we're trying to take a very patient approach um, in, this, this whole, in this whole effort. So in follow-up, I had a question from a parent. Um, is the, the Fifth Circuit Appeal Court decision going to put a stay in the mandate as we move forward? Right now, we're not a stay on our mandate. We are just continuing to best understand it. Is that correct, President Armacost? Yeah, so that I think the, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals was looking at a different provision. They were looking at the OSHA mandate, I think for um, employers with 100 or more persons. Um, uh, this mandate is a different one. This one is the one that applies to federal contractors and the university is a federal contractor. Um, we, we accept um, um, a significant amount of money from the federal government to do work that's uh, for the good of the nation. Um, and uh, and uh, consequently, um, it's a different provision and there's no court action yet uh, to prevent that mandate from happening. And uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues, Josh, I saw you perk up. I don't know if Dr. Wynn from the medical school um, has anything to add. Yeah, thanks very much, President Darmacost. No, I, I think you nailed it exactly correctly. I don't have anything to add, sir. And to the parents who emailed specifically asking about their student who works at the Ralph, to my knowledge, the Ralph Ingolstadt Arena is not part of a federal contract, so this would not then apply to your student. Again, to reiterate what President Armacost says, if this does apply to student employees, they would be contacted specifically by their employer. But again, I'm not aware of anything connected to the Ralph Ingolstadt Arena. Staying a little bit on um, vaccinations, Alex Pokronowski, I'm going to give this question to you. Question about um, booster shots. Are COVID booster shots available now in North Dakota for kids, so college age students? Are they available at Student Health or other locations in Grand Forks? So Alex, maybe just an overview of where we're at with vaccines on campus and in Grand Forks. Yep. Hello everyone, Alex Pokronowski, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, the answer to all those questions is yes. Yes, COVID shots are available. Uh, for students, COVID shots are available for students on campus as well as in the Grand Forks community. Student Health Services gives COVID shots as well as the booster shots to people on a daily basis. So if you or your student is interested in getting their COVID shot or their booster shot, please reach out to Student Health 701-777-4500 or just go on our website right at the top banner. It has the COVID information, including vaccine information there. Thanks, Alex. President Armacost, we're gonna stay in COVID. And another question for you, and this one I know you get asked all the time, when will the mask mandate be lifted? Um, will it be lifted for the spring semester? So could you share the metrics that you're watching or that we're watching as a campus related to um, face coverings? Yeah, the key metric is, uh, is the transmission metric. And this measures how quickly um, virus is spreading within the community. And um, 
And that metric has to, uh, before we uh, release the mask mandate on campus, um, it will need to be in what we call the yellow range. And I forget, I think that's the moderate range. The range is um, fewer than 50 cases over seven days, 50 cases per 100,000 people over a seven day period. And uh, currently that metric is, last time I looked, I think it was on Friday, was at 290 cases per 100,000 over a seven day period. So, and it's, it's kind of holding steady at that uh, 250 to 300 level. Um, so we need to make uh, continued progress on reducing the transmission of the virus. And, um, and when it gets below 50, um, that's when, um, when we'll get to the point where we can uh, release the mask mandate. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do this question probably to you, Dr. Wynn. I think you're the, the lone MD in this um, uh, town hall tonight. So a question, and in, in, it may be easiest for you. It's in the Q&A, and I want to get things right. But the question is, according to the FDA fact sheet, vaccine information fact sheet for recipients and caregivers about comorbidity and Pfizer biotech Net taxi, this is where I didn't take biology classes, sorry, COVID-19 vaccine, it says that you will be offered fully licensed um, or Pfizer biotech, um, it's a, a vaccine, but unavailable. Um, these are all, it references, these are all EUA, which says it is your choice. How is this mandate allowed when the licensed vaccine is not available anywhere. So again, some of those specifics, Dr. Wynn, the terms maybe that I didn't pronounce correctly um, are in the Q&A. So I don't know if you can see that question, Dr. Wynn. Uh, uh, hi everyone, Josh Wynn, Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of your School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And I assume this, the question relates to the executive order mandate, I'm, I'm not, is that what you understand, Cassie? I'm assuming yes. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I, th this is almost a legal question and I'm not sure an MD is the one who's gonna be able uh, to answer it uh, as far as what is allowed under either an um, EUA is emergency use authorization or fully licensed. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I have the legal um, background to be able to answer that. I may try to punt this to President Dharmakas, who uh, is very knowledgeable about these issues. Uh, Andy, can you help me out on this one? No, I can't. Sorry. Joe, I see that it's a question from you. What I can do is I can see if we can maybe get this one to our general counsel. Um, and see again in, in reference to Dr. Wynn that um, maybe this is one better pose for your lawyer. So we will take this one down and, um, or you can email me directly. It's just the cassie.gerhardt at und.edu and we'll do some follow-up if we can't get you an answer tonight. So my apologies. And so, this question is, I mean, it, it's a great question about licensing and, uh, and, um, and the federal mandate. Um, the, the challenge is um, uh, the university is not in a position to um, challenge the federal mandate. Our attorney general is, and that's the, the lawsuit is going forward there. So um, they're going to act on our behalf in terms of what's the proper uh, balance and are any constitutional rights being trampled upon. So Joe, we'll get you some more follow-up. So completely shifting gears for a minute here, and we can certainly come back if there's additional questions. Orlin or Sassen, I'm going to um, ask this question of you. People thinking ahead towards um, Thanksgiving and some students that will be staying on campus. Can you talk about what will be available over Thanksgiving break in terms of food services? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Orlin Rosasson, Director of Dining Services. And, and Cassie, that's a great question because everybody's going to want to have something to eat over that break. So uh, I'm just going to start with Thanksgiving Day and it's kind of work on from there. Thanksgiving Day, we're offering... Uh, to the to the basically the campus community, I guess students that are living in the residence halls or students that are on campus or are in adjacent to campus that are needing a, a place for a Thanksgiving meal, we're going to offer a traditional Thanksgiving meal over lunch from 11 to 1:30. Uh, we partnered with uh, parents program and student involvement for the the non residence hall students, and and they will be handing out vouchers next week over in the student involvement office in the student union. So. If you're not a residence hall student, I'd encourage you to go over there and pick up your voucher. If you're a residence hall student, we're working with our mobile order app, Grubhub, 
uh, we are asking you to go ahead and just let us know that you're coming so we have the right number of meals that are prepared and we don't get caught shorthanded. If you're also, if, again, if you're living in a residence hall, we're also going to provide a sack lunch for, for Tuesday night. You'll be able to pick that up uh, when you're coming to the dining center for your Thanksgiving meal at, at noon. You mean Thursday night, right, Orlin? You said Tuesday night. Thursday night is what that is. Yeah, it's that Thursday night. For. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm saying no, Tuesday. Fine. It is Thursday night. Yep, absolutely. Friday then will be open. Uh, we'll do a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we're going to have limited hours. Uh, breakfast would be like 7 to 9. Uh, lunch would be like 11 to 1. And dinner would be 4.30 to 6.30. And we, we reduce the hours of service simply because there's just not enough people around for us to be open straight through and we would not be able to provide quality food. So uh, we, we reduce it down to those those time periods. And we'll do on Saturday, we'll be open for like a brunch and dinner. Uh, brunch again, 11 to one, dinner uh, 4.30 to 6.30. Sunday, uh, brunch again from 11 to one, but then we'll open up a dinner for 4.30 and we'll stay open till 11 o'clock at night. So with our uh, late night extended dinner service. So, so there is food available uh, during the whole break. You know, we want to make sure students are, are well taken care of. So, and obviously if, if those time periods don't work out real well for your student, you know, we do take out through all of our, our meal periods. So, you know, if they need to take something with them, just let the person at the cashier stand know that, hey, you know, I, I'm in for lunch, but I need to take dinner with me. So, so that we want to make sure they're well taken care of. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks, Arlen. I will attest, Thanksgiving in Wilkerson Commons may not be as good as mom or grandma or dad would make, but it's a pretty close second. I had it there last year. So Orlin does a really good job in his team of making sure there's some of the comforts um, on the holidays for our students who aren't able to be with family. Alex, a question for you. If someone loses their um, vaccine card and got their vaccines at Student Health Services, can they go back to Student Health Services to get a new vaccine card? Yeah, and then as I was reading the question, I think it said on campus. And I think, so just to be clear, if, if the student got it on campus, they got it through student health. And so they could either reach out to student health or go to student health or log into their My Health patient portal, uh, which is all available on the student health website to get that information. Alex, since you're unmuted, I got another question coming your way. And this is one that was sent to me earlier today. Can someone other than the student self-report COVID results on UND's webpage? And then if someone else reports positive COVID results, is it still called self-reporting? So maybe just the way that you get reports and what follow-up um, is entailed then. Yep. So the overwhelming majority of our reports are just that a self-report coming from a student after they test positive. There are some uh, instances where we get a report from our contact tracing teams that we do not get a corresponding report from the specific student. And so then we submit a self-report on the student's behalf. Uh, we do that so that the student can get the information regarding our expectations for students who have tested positive for COVID, as well as so they get the information regarding resources and services that are available for students, like absence notifications if they're not able to go to class because they tested positive and those sorts of things. Dr. Wayne, did you have something else you wanted to add there, sir? Yeah, thank you, Cassie. I just, I, I'm putting on my doctor hat now with the, the question about the vaccine card, if you happen to lose it. I would remind you, I don't know if my phone is showing up, a good idea, something that I do and my wife has done is take a picture of the card uh, so that you have it on your phone. Both of us, my wife and I have both of our cards uh, photographed. So that's a good way of keeping a record of it. I just wanted to uh, point that out. And I love to suggest students something a little techy. That's, uh, that's a first for me. Well, Dr. Wynn, I would go on to say, and if you're my age, you also take a picture of your parents' vaccination cards so you can keep it handy should they lose it. So just it's the full circle of how we cover for each other. So Carla, did you have something else to add? Uh, yes, I just wanted to add um, that if you're doing any international travel, a printout from your medical record or health record will not work. You actually need the CDC vaccination card. So um, if you have lost it, you can get a new one, but um, you cannot use a printout from your medical record. Thanks, Carla. That's Carla's way of just reminding us she just got back from a wonderful vacation. And so it's just the way she reminds all of us. So thanks, Carla. No, it's good advice, especially as some of our students will probably be traveling internationally over the break. 
President Armacost, I'm going to switch gears a little bit in another um, topic that we've received some emails about. And I'm just going to read this one the way it was sent to me, sir. Why does UND feel it's so important to get in the middle of the pronoun issue? And you might need no, to add some context for that one. Um, yeah. for folks. So the context is, for those who aren't familiar with pronouns, is um, uh, folks... Um, our, our transgender students um, have uh, identified with a gender that may be different from their uh, biological sex at birth. And, um, and this is, uh, they're important members of our community, just like all of our students are. And uh, it has become commonplace over the last few years. And you see it, I don't know if we have anybody on the screen that have their pronouns listed, but um, uh, people list those. My daughters list, list she, her, hers. And, uh, and uh, those who are transgender, you'll see uh, many of them list, uh, uh, they instead of she or he, and uh, and this is um, this is their preference for how to be referred by their peers, by their faculty members, by administrators on the campus, and so there has been work across the North Dakota University system to create policies that allow um, our systems to recognize what people prefer to be called, um, and um, and so I, I know I don't know if uh, if our registrar is on Scott Carell, I, he's not here today, but he was instrumental in, in working on this particular piece of, of policy. And so the campus is also um, discussing uh, this this issue and um, how do we um, how do we incorporate gender identity into um, into our campus in terms of how do you prevent discrimination against uh, people who are transgender um, people who um, again identify with a different um, a gender than their their um, sex assigned at birth. So um, it's it's um, this is going to require a lot of discussion on our campus. Um, but first and foremost, I always talk when I talk about um, how we treat people on our campus, we treat them with kindness, with dignity and respect. And this, this issue gets to the heart of that. How do we um, fairly treat and provide resources for our transgender students, faculty and staff members? That's what it's about. Thank you, President Armacost. Dr. Wynn, I'm gonna send this one to you. And um, the question is, are students or anyone who are mandated to receive a vaccine given a fact sheet of the risks, especially the young people, what recourse would a student have if they are injured from the vaccine, which has been uh, shown according to the CDC Bayer's website? Can you just talk about the information that people are given at the point of vaccination? I don't know that I remember what I was given, but maybe you have an understanding of that from um, your involvement with this work. Well, uh, thanks, Cassie. And maybe we'll ask someone from the Student Health Service to actually say what we do at UND. Maybe I could just address a little bit of the risk issue from a health standpoint, and then we can get to the real substance of the question is as to how are people uh, notified of this. Let me just say that, that there is a very small but finite risk from vaccination, uh, but when you compare it to the risk of the complications of SARS-CoV-2, the benefit of vaccination far exceeds the risk. The one thing that I will emphasize, since it's had some press, some attention in the, in the press, has been the increased risk of heart inflammation. We call it myocarditis, particularly in younger males, teenage or older males. And there is a clear increased risk of myocarditis after vaccination with certain of the vaccines uh, uh, in those males. The interesting thing is, if you look at a population, the risk of myocarditis actually goes down if you get vaccinated, because guess what else causes myocarditis in addition to the vaccine? It's COVID-19. And if you reduce the frequency of that, your risk is actually lower. So the bottom line is the risks are far less than the benefits. But maybe someone from Student Health Service could address whether we actually hand out a, uh, a, a handout with some of those uh, uh, potential risks. I don't actually know the answer, Cassie. Do we have someone who can answer that part Alex of the question? Alex is going to, I think, try it, Dr. Wynn. Alex may have some information. Yep, so unfortunately, you. we don't have anyone from Student Health with us tonight. I was just looking on my health portal to see if I could see the forms uh, as I just got my booster from them last week. And so I was looking to see. I know that we, 
every person that goes in has to fill out a number of forms uh, about the vaccine. And then when they're getting the vaccine, the nurse or the provider that is uh, providing the shot goes over and asks questions and goes over information with them directly as well. Uh, they did not have a physical handout uh, from when we when I was there, but there was online forms that they needed to fill out to consent uh, to receive the vaccine. I also know that if anybody has any questions, our colleagues in Student Health Services are happy to have the conversations with people before they go through the vaccine if that's where they're at. So happy to have those conversations as well. Alex, I'm gonna send this question to you and this is one I got earlier today and I had let you know. So this is one, how does the university deal with and educate students about college bullying? It seems to primarily take the form of cyberbullying and relational aggression and is quite a serious problem for some to the point of making some students consider leaving the school. So maybe to talk about what we do and how to report if people are aware of concerns. Yep, and so the first thing I'll say for how to report if people are aware of concerns, if you go to the Safe UND website, so just und.edu backslash Safe UND, it has a lot of information about how to report, uh, where you can get help, uh, what types of things we do to respond to, to situations, but that's a great place to go to, to find reporting options that people have. Uh, and then as it speaks to the other part of the question was, what do we do to educate? Uh, the first thing I'll share, and I think a portion of it, Cassie, was relationship-based uh, bullying and those sorts of things. That, that really goes into a lot of our bystander education programs. Uh, all incoming new students complete a uh, sexual violence, healthy relationships, bystander education, uh, program as part of coming to school at, at UND. They also have to go over what are our policies at the University of North Dakota. In addition to that, we have the CVIC at UND program. Uh, and a large portion of what they do is education specifically about healthy relationships and bystander education. So if those types of issues are occurring that people one can identify them and then two know what some of their options or recourses are for addressing them. Thanks, Alex. Eric Martinson, I'm gonna start this question with you and Kaylin Reedy, if you want to add anything in, I'm gonna put you on the spot as well. Um, I actually got a call in my office about this same topic today. So I don't know if it's from the same person or not. But the question is, does UND set any standard of conduct in the student section at hockey games? There was a lot of disrespectful chants to the opposing team Saturday evening, including a lot of profanity. So Eric, if you've got any um, thoughts on this, and then Kaylin, as a student leader yourself, um, I'll turn to you. So first you, Eric. Thanks, Cassie. My name is Eric Martins, and I'm the Associate Athletics Director um, within Athletics. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the question. It's one that, that we don't take uh, lightly with the, uh, the profanity that was um, this last weekend and things that we try to do um, from a from an usher standpoint and the management standpoint of, of each game that if we, if we do see those things, we do send our security um, and things um, to that to the area of where it's reported or where it's seen um, and try to tamp down those those chants. Um, very hard to do with a large crowd and something that um, we try to try to take care of and try to try to nip right away. Um, obviously with with the game that, that happened, um, it's hard to hard to corral when everything else is going on, but it's something that um, again we don't take um, you know lightly and that we, we, we did send people over there and did try to help with the crowd. It's something that we'll work with uh, student leaders on on just trying to set an example of, of you know better better chance. Um, and things like that, that, that we don't want to see the, the profanity within those chants. So hard to do, uh, tough question, but yeah, we do have a set of conduct um, that we try to try to help with, and that's with the, uh, the ushers and security that are there. Thanks, Eric. Kaylin, did you want to add anything from a student perspective? Yeah, just real quick. Um, like Eric said, it's all about setting an example. Um, hockey games, of course, are an outlet for students to really get a lot of that energy out. And ideally, it goes to um, chants that are supportive and um, a way for people to really release that energy. And other times, it can kind of delve into um, something a little more inappropriate. Um, like Eric said, it's all about setting an example. Um, and there are students who um, do try to tone down their peers when they start getting a little too far into that category. Thanks to you both. I appreciate it. President Armacost, I think you might be reading. There's been a couple of questions that have been directed, I think, specifically for your response as the president. And so I, I hate to put you on the spot, but this is one. Um, 
Taking the Lord's name in vain is offensive to many students. Why not protect them from such offensive words? Where does the need to protect various groups end? And I think this is a follow-up to the conversation regarding pronouns. Yeah, interesting. So I'm in a room that uh, the lights just went off. So hold on one second uh, while I turn it back on. He's been sitting too still in his room. So there's the energy saving. <laughs> I'm in Bismarck at the state capitol, and it's a room I've never sat in. Um, every 15 minutes, the lights go off. Um, hey, thanks for that question. Um, it's a good one. I, you know, there are many offensive words. We just heard a discussion about hockey, right, and uh, and offensive words that are there as well. And uh, and I think um, on college campuses, um, uh, we try to promote free speech uh, uh, as as a as an important cause, an important uh, ideal to uphold. Um, and we have very specific policies on campus that um, tell us when that free speech goes too far. Um, and that there are student on student harassment uh, policies that we have that are very well crafted. And it, it really follows uh, the state law that was, there was a free speech law that was put into place um, last spring to protect uh, the rights to free speech on campus. And, and so our discrimination policies and our student on student harassment policies uh, address what the thresholds are. Um, they have to be, um, Oh, is Donna Smith here? I don't know. Uh, um, Alex, uh, what are the words? Alex Pokonowski. Severe, persistent, uh, sorry, severe and pervasive and objectively offensive. Right. So, um, so there's a measure there that when something um, reaches that point. And so use of pronouns is something that um, I think it's a nice courteous thing to do for, uh, for the students, um, our, our transgender students. Um, and, and not using the Lord's name in vain is a nice thing to do for um, our um, for our students who um, who follow the Lord. Um, and I, it's really important uh, for us to know when um, when to um, when offensive behavior becomes discriminatory or harassing. And uh, and so that's that's where the threshold is. Now the second part of the question. Let me go back to Cassie. You sent it to me, or Christy sent it to me. Um, um, the second statement was about. Um, broad statements about vaccines. And um, uh, yeah, the, you, who, the, whoever wrote this is correct. I mean, the risks to different age groups um, is different. Um, and uh, we, we try not to make blanket statements about, um, about, um, about how individuals might be at risk uh, for the vaccination. We do know though that um, the vaccines do reduce the risk among all age groups. And we do, uh, that's why we encourage them. Um, but uh, again, on the campus, what we're trying to do is make sure that um, uh, when this federal vaccine mandate, it applies to employees. And we talked about very specific cases of when we think it applies. Um, so um, dining service workers, for example, um, student dining service workers, um, uh, our current read is it doesn't apply to dining service workers, um, but it does apply to somebody who's working on a federal contract because that's the federal mandate. Now, as that as that rule or that uh, our understanding of that rule changes over time, or if the federal government modifies their language or imposes something upon the university, that's when we'll get back to you and say that our interpretation is different. Um, but I don't mean to characterize um, all students or anyone on our campus as being the same as, as another person on our campus. So thanks for the questions. Thanks, President Armacost. I'm gonna stay in the COVID. I know there's another topic and we're gonna switch to that, but I'm gonna stay in COVID. And Dr. Wynn, I'm gonna send this one to you. If a student has previously had COVID and recovered well, which has often shown in younger people, would an antibody test be acceptable? I have heard possibly it is unwise to have the injection after recovery because antibodies are long lasting and robust. The vaccine has been shown to be waning and not as durable as natural immunity. Uh, so, um... The, the, there are two ways we can get immune protection to COVID and to, to most, to, to many viral infections. One, as you say, is to get the infection and then you get uh, uh, what we call natural immunity. The other way is to get vaccinated. One of the tests of how much protection we have are the antibodies, the proteins that the body makes in response to either the vaccine or getting, uh, getting COVID. The, the uh, simple answer is it's complicated because it turns out that the body's immune response is more than just antibodies. That's the, what we call the humoral component, but there's also a very complex cellular component and that is not measured by antibodies. 
And we, we actually have some reason to believe that the cellular, cellular component is even more important. Therefore, the, I think the short answer to your question is that we are not sure of what uh, antibodies indicate after getting uh, natural infection. Now, certainly the absence of antibodies would suggest uh, low protection, but even robust antibodies may not indicate that you're fully protected because we're not measuring with the antibodies a whole component of the way the body protects itself. Thus, the CDC guidelines are that even if you've had COVID, you still should be vaccinated. So uh, uh, th that's a long answer. It's a good question, but unfortunately it's complicated. Thanks, Dr. Wynn. I'm going to switch gears here and I'm gonna direct this question. We're gonna to switch topics from vaccine to some of the um, recent events that have happened on campus um, related to the loss of one of our students, John Hauser. And Dean Krause and Dr. Bierke, I'm gonna send this one to you and probably a couple of responses. So um, could you please address the recent UND plane crash um, that resulted in the loss of one of our students and the mental health initiative that is being created by his family. So. Um, Dean Krause, if you can talk about the endowment um, fund that has been established um, at John's parents' wishes, and then what UND is looking at doing to prevent this from happening again. So Dean Krause, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kick us off in responding to this one. Thanks, Cassie, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dean Bob Krause, the Dean of the John D. Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences, and uh, we are still recovering from the, the tragic loss of, of John Hauser on October 18th. Uh, following that accident, John's family did establish the John A. Hauser Memorial Mental Health and Aviation Fund. Uh, it is currently a fund, and within a week of, of the, of the uh, establishment of that fund, we had received over $26,000 and, and counting. Uh, so thanks to all the people that did contribute to that. We had established a mental health task force in the spring, starting out by gauging interests in, or not interest, but uh, the, the health environment of our students and faculty and staff. And I'll, in a moment, I'll turn it over to my associate dean who helped a lot with that survey. We're getting the results of those survey in now. Um, the other thing we're doing is, is in addition to providing resources to our students, uh, we're trying to identify other resources that students in aviation are able to access that are either anonymous or won't end up in their medical records because that's the big fear is, is a lot of students are afraid to talk to a doctor or, or a therapist because they don't want to get grounded or hurt their career. So we're trying to identify all of those resources, not only talking to other flight schools around the country, but also talking especially to the airlines and the airline unions that are out there because they have a lot of resources available to them and we're uh, trying to leverage what they have and bring that type of thing down to our level. And then uh, the other part is just uh, educating our students uh, that it is okay to talk to people, that it is that it is uh, okay to, to not be perfect. Um, and we're coming up with some other initiatives and getting more information out there uh, that, you know, other, I mean, we'll have some, some short video clips coming out in the month of December. We're very excited about that. Um, I'm just trying to think there was one more thing I wanted to say. I'll come back to that. I'll turn it over to Beth. Beth, you want to talk real quick? Yes, thank you, Dean Krauss. I'm Beth Berkey, the Associate Dean of the College of Aerospace. And like Dean Krauss mentioned, we are very concerned about everybody's mental state right now as we emerge out of this pandemic and continue on uh, with some of the stressors inherent in flight education and education in general. So like Dean Krauss mentioned, we did stand up a, an internal UND task force last spring and we were uh, fortunate to have experts across our campus. We have faculty from our counseling psychology as part of this task force. We have folks from our Office of Student Rights and Responsibility, our Office of uh, the University Counseling Center all came together along with our aviation faculty, uh, flight instructors and students to really tackle this topic and discuss it. And with that, we've done some, some research, we've embedded things within our programming, uh, but now we're also standing up a more national level mental health and aviation summit that we're gonna be hosting in on December 15th in partnership with United Airlines 
uh, and United's uh, ELPA Pilot Union. And uh, we reached out, we're gonna have eight other schools participating in this summit and there will be a virtual registration option as well that we're hoping to get that information out uh, to our students, faculty and staff here at UND because we can't, we're not gonna solve this issue internally at UND and it's, a, it's an issue that others uh, are concerned about as well. And so again, we're trying to bring this conversation more to uh, a national level. The FA is gonna be involved in our summit along with, like Dean Krause mentioned, airlines, other schools, and other experts uh, in this area. The other thing I wanted to, to mention real quick is uh, we are also looking at all of our internal processes uh, to see if there's if there are stress points that are under our control or things that are within our scheduling system or our uh, check rides or our instructional methods um, that are adding to or contributing to stress among our students. And if we're, if we're able to correct those things uh, and create less stress in the process, uh, we will be looking into fixing those. Thanks to you both. And um, again, to our entire um, JDO family um, for all the support parents have offered and for the faculty and staff, it's, um, we've certainly felt it. And we know we've heard from a number of parents and family members over the last couple of weeks. So I'm gonna switch back to COVID now. So Alex, a question that I'm gonna send to you. Um, if I've come in contact with someone who just has tested positive for COVID, what's the procedure? I'm in an in-person on-campus class where we do not stream the course remotely and I don't want to miss my lectures and fall behind. So can you talk about close contact? And probably the first question is vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Yeah, so I think vaccinated versus unvaccinated, then mass versus unmasked are kind of the different layers of, of that question. And so if a person is vaccinated, uh, that they would not need to, to change or, or do anything different. We would just ask that they monitor themselves for symptoms and if they become symptomatic to get tested five to seven days after that exposure. Uh, I know at the start of this town hall, we talked about the mask mandate that, that's on campus. Uh, a large benefit of that is allows people to stay in class whether they were uh, vaccinated or not vaccinated. So if, if this example took place in a classroom, uh, everyone would have been mass and then they would not have to uh, quarantine if it was a mass close contact they'd be able to continue to attend class if it was an unmasked unvaccinated close contact where the person would was asked to quarantine or recommended to quarantine they would not be eligible to come on campus when those things uh, occur what we do is we reach out to the faculty and ask the faculty to work with the student uh, so that they can be able to continue to engage in the class, even if it's in a slightly different mode for that. Again, five to seven days until a person chooses to test out of uh, quarantine or if they go the full 14 days of the quarantine period for that two week period. And as a reminder, a lot of the information that Alex just shared is also posted on our website. So if you go to the COVID-19 site, and look under student reporting and scroll down, there's a whole grid um, that explains should I isolate or quarantine and breaks it down based on vaccination and not. So a good place to start to get some initial information. President Armacost, I'm gonna send this one to you and this goes back, back to the conversation about vaccine mandates. So the question, what is going to happen if professors don't get vaccinated with the new vaccine mandate? So I think this is again, a clarification of where we're at with the mandate and how that may or may not impact our faculty members? Sure, it probably depends on the faculty member, uh, first of all. So given our, our current interpretation, and that is um, the connection to federal contracts or, um, or working directly on a federal contract, if a professor um, isn't, um, isn't involved in that way, um, they will not be mandated uh, to vaccinate. Um, so we won't even ask them. Um, if they are in that position and they refuse to vaccinate, the federal government came back with revised um, steps that we should take um, uh, last Monday and they backed off on the talk of immediate termination. And they said, listen, if somebody doesn't vaccinate, work with them, uh, go through educational programs, um, try other remediation, and then, and then eventually um, uh, consider termination. Um, so it's really kind of a, multi-step process. If somebody's required to vaccinate, whether it's a faculty member, a staff member, or in the rare case, a student who is working on one of these federal contracts, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very deliberate process that we'll go through, um, beginning with a discussion um, and then educational um, materials. And then uh, again, this is the federal government that's, um, that's uh, setting those expectations. So um, hope that provides some clarity to the questioner. Thanks, President Armacost. Alex and 
Ashley, I'm going to send this one to you. And um, the question is, is there any recourse for students who suffered academically during the 2020-2021 um, school year due to online learning? And so this really is looking back at not our current year, but the question is specific to the last academic year. So Ashley, Alex, I'll pivot this one to the two of you. They were both looking at each other off screen to see who wants to go, go first. So first thing I, I can share is that if there is some other set of life uh, circumstances that is uh, accompanying that, we have what's called the special circumstance or late withdrawal process. Uh, someone can go to the Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities or OSRR website to learn more about that. That's not generally available for students, but it is available for people who have had some set of uh, circumstances occur uh, within the past year uh, to, to look back to to possibly be able to make some adjustments or drop courses retroactively, those sorts of things. Uh, again, that's not just because online classes were a different environment, but if there's some other like set of circumstances that occurred uh, that the individual was dealing with, that, that might be an option that's available to them. Thank you. Ashley Vegan, Director of Student Academic Success and Career Engagement. Um, I would also recommend um, your student or other students work with their academic advisor um, to make sure that they are still on track for their four-year graduation plan and whatever goals they have in mind. Um, if repeating that course or courses um, is in the best interest of the student, your advisor will know that information um, very quickly for you and can recommend um, the best plan for you to repeat those courses. Um, Look up your advisor in Starfish. If you'd like to send me an email, it's ashley.vegan at und.edu. I can connect you directly with your academic advisor, take a look at transcripts, um, and figure out how to those uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Provost Link, I think I'm gonna send this one to you given it's specific to a college. And Ashley, certainly if you've got anything to offer, by all means, please do so. So this question um, is, will the university consider offering more business courses online, either synchronously or asynchronously. During the height of COVID, virtually all courses were offered online, but during registration, I have noticed many courses do not offer an online option. So Provost Link, I don't know if you've got anything to offer there. Uh, hey, Cassie, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the person who asked that question. I'm Eric Link, I'm the provost here at UND. Uh, so we have courses offered in a variety of modalities across campus. Uh, I can't speak specifically to a given course that you might be interested in, uh, but throughout all of our colleges, uh, we have courses that are offered face-to-face, -face, offered hybrid, offered online. Those online courses could be synchronous, they could be asynchronous. Uh, the most important thing that I could say, and uh, perhaps Ashley will want to uh, expand on this a little bit if she'd like, uh, is to work closely with your advisor uh, to try and put together a schedule that works best for you, for your schedule, for your life, and for your learning needs to keep you on track for success and a timely graduation. So on that note, um, I'll toss it over to Ashley if she has any other items to add. Thank you. Yeah, I think that covers it. Um, advisors can work with you on um, the different manner in which your courses are being offered. Potentially, they um, can connect you with a faculty member to see if there are different options um, for your specific situation that are potentially not offered on campus connection or that you're not seeing. Um, but yeah, the key is working with your advisor to see what different options um, there are, perhaps we do have the summer term coming up as well. Um, perhaps there are certain courses that might be offered in the summer semester in a different um, modality than is offered in the spring. Um, summer schedules are starting to come out slowly but surely um, in the next couple of weeks as well, so. Dawson, you wanted to add something to that one? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Dawson Duchuk, student body vice president. Um, as a student in the College of Business and Public Administration, um, I'm currently taking two in-person classes that um, are also offering hybrid options that wasn't listed on uh, Campus Connection anywhere. But um, once getting into the class, uh, both classes have been set up to basically be able to be completed asynchronously. So if you're gone, um, professors have been offering Zoom options or recording lectures and posting them later. Um, so I think a lot of it comes down to what the professor's doing, even if it's not listed as a hybrid class or online class, um, a lot of them are being very flexible. 
Thanks, Dawson. President Armacost, Dr. Wynn, another question in the area of vaccines that I'm gonna to send to the two of you. So how will students be treated differently between vaccinated and unvaccinated? I'm confused because it is known that vaccinated people can still contract and transmit COVID and also carry the same viral loads. Therefore, what is the rationale for different policies for vaccinated versus unvaccinated? It is concerning for non-discrimination reasons based on vaccine status, which has never been done before. Interesting. I, I might uh, not fully understand the question, but um, just note that um, the uh, the mandate we have, the, max, the, the, the masking mandate on campus applies equally to um, vaccinated and unvaccinated people for that very reason, um, that in this time of high transmissibility, uh, you know, we're, we're in the, the red category, that 200 and I forget what the thresholds are, but it's way up there. Um, uh, we, we treat um, the, uh, the masking requirements exactly the same for both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So um, when we get back down to um, the yellow level of transmissibility, that's, that's when things will change a little bit. And if you recall, before we got to yellow, um, the vaccine mandate was a suggestion uh, at that point uh, for people to, to wear masks. Um, so we'll see if we get there. Um, it will require the work of, of the campus to, to keep the transmissibility in check. Josh, Dr. Wynn, over to you. Thanks, President Armacost. No, uh, I, I would just reiterate what the president said. You know, the federal mandate notwithstanding, up until this point, we don't really officially know the vaccination status of anyone. So we, one has to assume that we're all not vaccinated. I would rather assume that we all are, but therefore we need to use the appropriate precautions as the president outlined. Now you're right, there, there could be conceptually advantages if you're vaccinated and so forth, but since un, up until the present, we don't know officially who is vaccinated and who is not, there really isn't any differentiation uh, between who is and who isn't. Now someone can volunteer it, but UND does not uh, uh, require that you identify as such. By the way, I'm fully vaccinated. I volunteer that information. Thank you both. Orlin, another question for you. This question is, when will more food service areas reopen? And I'm assuming this is specifically um, referencing to Squires. And then a follow-up is, and when will the food service experience start improving soon? I think, again, some of the challenges you faced in regarding um, employees to solve. But if you could talk to, when will more food service areas reopen? Yes, Cassie, thank you. Uh, good question. Uh, you know, our we, we continue to work towards getting uh, the food service areas open, especially Squires, and, and we're still working to try and get all areas open in Wilkerson. I mean, that's really, you know, has, I won't say it's it's been our only focus because obviously we're trying to focus on both of them, but uh, it, it's been extremely difficult this fall with staffing. I mean, we hire a couple of people and it's like we, uh, we lose a few people. Uh, and, and of course, then our student staffing has been an extreme ch challenge for us. We, we still don't have enough student staff to actually staff all of the concepts in the Wilkerson Dining Center. So, you know, we, and, uh, we just haven't been successful with hiring. I mean, we've tried a number of things with sign-on bonuses and, and, you know, we increased student wages last fall. We did the same with our professional staff. So, I mean, you know, we, we just continue to struggle with it, I guess. You know, we have added a few things in Wilkerson. Uh, recently, we were able to get uh, the sizzling salads concept open at least three days a week over lunch. Uh, we've opened up the chef's table where we're doing a rotating menu through that that concept. You know, so I mean, as, as we're getting, you know, a, a person or two here and there, we've been able to add some uh, concepts, I guess, and get things open. You know, and, and, and as I said, I mean, that certainly is our goal. You know, and I'm just going to throw this in there that if is you as a student, if you're listening, we need your help. It's really what it boils down to. We, we need to hire students and you can help be a part of the solution here by coming to work for dining services. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks, Orlin. Um, I know your team is doing the best that they can. Um, we just need more people to work in dining services. I know there's a question was asked about December graduation. We're gonna answer that in the prompt. Yes, December commencement is in person. So we'll follow up. I'll get that one really quick. Melanie is also responding. Um, Dean Krause or Dr. Bierke, a question. 
how will the aviation deans be following up with students and parents regarding any changes made with flight operations? So I'll, I'll take the start of that and I'll let Beth fill in also. So our standard method of informing students of how things are going on is through email as well as working through our flight instructors. And so there's communication. If it's a major change, it's going to come out from me. Uh, if it's a minor change, it's going to come out from our our chief flight instructor. And if it's just a daily procedural bureaucracy type thing, it may just go through the flight instructors. If we're talking major course scheduling type changes, it's going to be something that's going to come from me. Uh, Beth, is there something you want to add? You're muted. A darn mute. A couple of venues that we do communicate with our, our students and parents are also welcome to join. We do have a, a weekly newsletter that comes out on Friday. We're oftentimes putting uh, notices and information in there. Uh, but I'm also going to parlay it over to Brian Willis, our Director of Aviation Safety, who does a fantastic job uh, in our safety department getting information out to students. Yeah, I, so pretty much anything that we're trying to get out, uh, again, we, we utilize the listserv, we utilize any changes organizationally, um, again, backing up whether it's, whether it's COVID related or whether it's internal uh, safety related or even procedural wise. So uh, the team at the airport works cl closely with both uh, campus faculty uh, and the airport to, to try to get that message out to all of our individuals. Okay, Beth, thanks, Brian. Beth, lots of questions. Where do you get the weekly aviation newsletter? Do you want to share with family members how they can get the newsletter? Yeah, well, I think the easiest way on this venue would be just to email me, elizabeth.birke at und.edu, and I'm happy to add you to our listserv. And it goes out Friday mornings. So again, I will type that as well. <laughs> so for those of you looking to get to an app, uh, uh, Beth is going to add that um, to the chat as well, but it's elizabeth.birke as you see it on the screen um, at und.edu and Beth can get you added. I think we're getting, um, oh, Ashley, great reminder. If I just saw that in the chat, we are getting near the time of registering for the spring. Did you wanna add something there? I'm gonna let you go ahead. A good reminder for families and students and parents. Yeah, just a reminder that spring 2022 registration is underway. Um, depending on the number of credits you as a student or your student has, um, your registration date and time is in Campus Connection. Um, so dates go all the way until November 19th. And then at that point, it is open registration for all students. Um, so be looking at those classes, talking with your advisor so that you can um, pick all of your right courses for the spring semester. Thanks, Ashley. A great reminder. We are coming to the end of our time and I don't see any more questions. As always, if you have any questions that we, for some reason, didn't get to, I think we got them or you think of something when we hang up. Many of you got an email from Christy Okerlund today with my email in it, um, cassie.gerhardt at und.edu. Happy to continue to follow up on questions you may have. I know how to reach the people who are with us this evening. I'm happy to give them all the hard questions. I will take the softball easy ones that you send my way. But I think President Armacos, I'm going to send it to you for closing comments because I think we've reached the end. And before I say that, I'm just going to see if there's um, there's one more. One more. Um, when do Troy? When do returning students sign up for next year's housing? So they'd already be set for spring semester, but returning for um, fall 22. When does that start, Troy? Yeah, great. This is um, Troy Nolan, Director of Housing and Residence Life. Thank you for the question. Uh, we will be sending out information to students and to families of students over the next month or so here. I'm beginning to talk about the process of signing up for next year. The official process to sign up will start right after we get back from the semester break. Um, so please just continue to check your emails, talk with your resident assistant, and there will be more information available as we, as we go along. So thank you. No problem. It's exciting. I've got a kiddo that I think is going to be doing his own housing. I've got a freshman next fall. So I'm going to be on the other side of the Zoom town halls next year, um, asking all the tough questions. So with that, President Armacost, the lights are back on where you're at, just in time for you to wrap us up for the evening. Yeah, great. Thanks, Cassie. Great job um, uh, monitoring. And, and uh, thanks to Christy Okerlund for being kind of the behind the scenes uh, traffic officer, moving all the information back and forth to each of us. Um, Students and family members, we appreciate you being here. We, we want to make sure these forums are valuable to you. I know that um, in some cases we give you a great answer. In other cases, you might leave a little unsatisfied. Take us up on the offer to reach out uh, to continue the discussion. Um, 
we uh, we have uh, incredible respect for you and your students, and we want to make sure the experience they get here at UND is absolutely incredible. Um, I, these are tough times. Uh, we're balancing uh, state uh, pressures and, and decisions that are happening with the legislature, along with federal um, vaccine mandates, and uh, and as I said earlier, eagerly awaiting to see what happens um, with further guidance that comes either from the federal government or from uh, from the courts and uh, and we will keep you apprised of all that information because I know the vaccine mandate is probably one of the hottest issues right now on your minds. So let me thank all of the, the folks who contributed today. You probably didn't see all of them, um, but one who I introduced at the beginning, um, Dr. Beth Helwig, um, who's our Vice President for Student Affairs uh, here on an interim basis through the end of May. Um, Beth, I'll let you um, utter some noises so that the screen turns over to you so you can wave. Hi everyone, what a great evening. Thanks for all the wonderful questions and the fabulous answers. I feel like I've learned a lot tonight. Thank you. Great, and again, thanks to all of our panelists uh, tonight for, um, for being here, giving up your evening. Um, but uh, again, parents fam uh, and students, we're here to support.